Hello everyone, today we read and comment on the fifth paragraph of the second chapter of the second book of von Clausewitz von Kriege, the title being Reflections on Military Events Brought About the Want of a Theory. The text follows. As contemplation on war continually increased, and its history every day assumed more of a critical character, the urgent want appeared of the support of fixed maxims and rules in order that in the controversies naturally arising about military events the war of opinions might be brought to some one point. This whirl of opinions, which neither revolved on any central pivot nor according to any appreciable laws, could not but be very distasteful to people's minds. So, here continues von Clausewitz's historical excursus on the development of the theory of the art of war, uh, getting to the point where all these uh, stimulations, fundamentally, that um, emerged from the actual uh, military conduct in roughly the, the modern age, but as we, uh, as we uh, said also in the previous videos dedicated to these historical paragraphs, it's, it's really an atemporal dimension, if you really want it, because it's very conceptual, right? Brought to the necessity of um, aware, uh, you know, awarely, um, consciously producing a military theory, right? The previous paragraph that we have uh, read was talking about the fact that the, the real conduct of war uh, was um, only made it its appearance incidentally and incognito, right? So at the beginning, in in a way that really didn't quite um, thought of a theoretical systematization, right? But that the more the intuitions began to you know the, the, the to develop and to to show that there was an actual relation between the the advantages that the development of a more orderly thought about this, um, co uh, about war, uh, could have a real, in fact, impact on, on the conduct of war. Well, this is where the theory starts to be required in some ways. And the way it's achieved uh, naturally takes a, a lot of time. We have observed how fundamentally, up to von Clausewitz, this development of, of, an, of a theory uh, was fundamentally uh, lacking something, right? It was a long-term process that included, in this theory, many other intuitions and thoughts that uh, were not necessarily even mistaken, but that hadn't, still didn't take, um, from in, in terms of a scientific approach, the possibility of the construction of a theory. Mm? Always bearing in mind that a theoretical <coughs> Modus, um, let's say a theoretical method. Uh, excuse me, a scientific method is still different from a, the concept of a science of a war that doesn't quite exist. And the world von Kriege is built on this assumption. That there is no, uh, in fact, science of war. There is no theory of the science of war. There is a theory of the art of war, right? But naturally, this theory has to have to to um, be founded on. A, a scientific criterion, right? And and this is important because still, um, in this von Clausewitz is, is is very clear, and you don't have to get fooled by the the easy um, you know uh, word switches that you can make. Uh, the lack of a science of war doesn't mean that you shouldn't act scientifically, that is rationally and objectively, when building its theory, right? And we will see how this uh, positive theory, because this is the problem. There, here there, there is the want of a positive theory, so something that you can apply to, to have a result. It's not an intellectual exercise, it's literally finding what really works, right, and, and uh, writing it in, in, into a manual, right, and therefore having this intuition that sometimes is, um, in fact, is um, too optimistic on the uh, possibility of uh, reducing the theory of war to simply something you can apply and that gives you victory quite easily, or at least that, uh, can make it <coughs> uh, can mm, can make it seen, even when victory is really not achieved, but where you, you uh, let's say something that can make you understand what should have been or should have not been done in that particular condition. Von Clausewitz rejects naturally this optimism and this positivistic take, um, always bearing in mind that objectively, yeah, theory 
serves to a purpose. The same phone calls which says, you know, yeah, we make a theory. Uh, at one point, there is a beautiful phrase that we've already read. The um, at the end of, the, of the, when he was talking about theory in the first chapter, he says, you know, uh, given all the mess that happens in war between attrition and the fog of war, so this evident impossibility of framing, um, like of 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 really uh, reading uh, what what reality is at any moment, and and more especially in war, that is the most messed up uh, human. Um, the most messed up system that humans can create in terms of real physical complexity. Well, um, this doesn't mean that you can't um, uh, refuse a theory. Because at that point you could say, well, okay, well I can't uh, foresee anything, I can't make an impact. No, you, you can. Always bear in mind that it's going to be marginal, right? But y still you need the theory, because if you don't know the theory, Objectively, you can't even do what what is necessary in theory to to put you in the condition of hoping to achieve a victory, which I which is different, right? And 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 this is particularly important because it's a cultural problem. Here we're talking about a civilization that starts posing itself um, such problems in the modern age, right? Um, also, in here we have distinguished already what. The, the difference between the theory and practice, for which uh, the theory here does not exclude um, the practice, doesn't surpass the practice. Von Clausewitz is the main advocate for, for this uh, concept, and we will see objectively how, in fact, direct military experience is 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 necessary, right? More than any other theoretical experience in absolute terms, in order to to command effectively, right, and to to achieve something. <coughs> but it's um, it's a cultural path that um, that has a, um, a a practical aim. You know, theory serves for practice as much as practice serves for theory, or maybe a bit more uh, in the second case, right? So um, it, it's here from the title: "Reflections on Military Events Brought About the Want of a Theory." Mm? So uh, it's, a, it's a broader reflection. It, it's a, if you want an intellectual exercise, mm, which doesn't mean uh, that this is, in fact, a direct understanding of, of history. Sometimes it was mediated that there were so many um, military theor theorists that objectively weren't much of military men themselves. And in that case, um, you can see in this broader Renaissance Europe how uh, war was interpreted in kind of in different ways in, in, um, and here uh, it's important because it's really about the art of war, the conduct of war um, uh, narrow, uh, I mean properly meant that is to be scoped, right? It's not war as something, you know, sparse in the in the atmosphere that you can gaze at and saying, oh well that's that's what I think, right, in expressing your ideas, your impressions, your opinions, right? And that's that's what makes von Clausewitz so great in many ways, because he he doesn't talk about this theorization. That this is very often the the prejudice that we have uh, as moderns towards certain um, theoretical constructions, right? You know, the idea that they are fundamentally abstract, that they are disconnected with reality. Von Clausewitz, um, I'm, I'm not even talking about the uh, scholarly level, but just I I in terms of cultural approach to him at a popular level, you see that there is this fundamental incomprehension, even of what von Clausewitz wrote, or what he was trying to say, wh what he, ma he achieved to say, actually. Um, and, um, and, um, the the utility that this has, I, I guess for for many people, von Clausewitz is just one of these military thinkers, probably um, <coughs> you know one of the most famous ones. But for this um, pretty silly attitude of um, you know contempt towards anybody's uh, intellectual uh, abilities, um, this idea, oh yeah, I know better. You know, this guy's writing a lot of things, and uh, you know, but real, uh, well, what you really need to know about war is just three simple essence principles. You know, that's all about it. No, it's an extremely complex theory that you have to study and spit blood on in order to understand. It's not your feelings about war, and instead, as a society, as uh, I would say, as, I as a civilization, also in the West, where we we produced <laughs> um, a thinker like von Clausewitz and 
I'm not saying that the rest of the world is better than in the <laughs> on at this level um, of theorization, is but, but has acquired von Clausewitz because the whole world works with the Clausewitzian theory, by the way. All the military uh, of the world do. So this is maybe, if anything, if you are a fan of, of, of pragmatic approaches, well, or empirical approaches, th this is a pretty good <laughs> demonstration of what von Clausewitz uh, achieved. So this is important, understanding the uh, applicability of these thoughts and their actual, the fact that they actually work. They actually work. It's not wishful thinking. It's literally describing what war is, right? What many other military theorists, also at the time of uh, von Clausewitz, weren't doing and instilling this prejudice that we still have that fundamentally if you abstract from everything you can obtain this positive theory. Well, yeah. You, theoretically, you can, but the problem is that in practice, that thing is completely becomes completely abstracted, because it's pretty obvious that everything could be sorted out uh, theoretically from a mathematical point of view. The real problem is how the hell do you sort that out? You know, look at the problems we what we have with, art with artificial intelligence today. You know, we can't make it do more than much objectively. Yeah, we we can make huge steps that naturally are prop propagandated as who knows what, but objectively those things do not work because the complexity of reality is still something that you have to deal with when you program them. So you can program them to respond to certain um, to certain conditions, but you, in order to do that you have to basically frame those conditions in, in a system that you are able to, to uh, in intellect, to, to think in the first place, which humans don't because War can't be sorted out. We we don't even understand what reality is, how it works. We 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 don't realize what what it what it means w to know, or to think, and how can we pretend that we can sort out such enormously complex systems like the ones of war? And there is always someone who tricks you in this, like because you can't say even military theory. Oh, but look at these statistics. But the statistics is, is is the product of something that, when d was being carried out, you you couldn't properly know, and that when you're going to apply once again are going to be applied, um, uh, in order to read certain systems and systems that are different and that are massively different, right? So you can't reason like that, and and this also stems from a certain prejudice that we have about um, the mechanistic approach to war, right? This is something that. I I see a lot happening also when in some comments some um is, you know the, the idea that war is essentially what matters about war is um at the bottom on on the battlefield right you know if if anything it's completely the reverse it's what happens at the top um <coughs> in headquarters that really makes it makes the difference so there is this attitude that since you know you can't thinking about I don't know that weapons or uh or certain you know tactics are fundamentally what ah uh, makes the whole thing work. No, th those are literally the kind of the, the least important things. That's just how combat is carried out. Well, strategy is something enormously more complex where you can carve this, the spaces that are much more profitably um, investigable, let's say, um, in order to, to win a war. So uh, this approach, that because tactics is objectively kind of the um, you know the the doctrine of the employment, the theory of the employment of armed forces during combat, and it's uh, it's the one among you know the, the military theory that gives the kind of the more more positivistic um, outcomes because essentially understanding a battle is way easier to understand a war. And generally speaking, yeah, even from a circular military historical point of view, if you study lots of battles of a certain age, etc., you read sources and you you start getting more or less how it worked. But this absolutely, and this is the great example, doesn't, for example, tell you in any way how you know how to predict how a clash could, could go. Every single battle is different, as every single army is different, as every single individual is different. So at that point, it, it does everything doesn't matter. The, the problem is finding, and this is what also von Clausewitz try, tries to do, what are the factors that can make a difference more than the ones that do make a difference right because at, at that point it's in the range of potential that th the mass happens we will we'll see that especially when talking about uh, attrition more more in detail 
uh, in von Clausewitz. So these concepts are uh, very, very useful for anyone who wants to approach military history in general because they, they set this pattern that far by, you know, giving color of it, they, they simply give you a, essentially a field of orientation and then you have power to orient yourself for it. In, in other words, you have to study, you have to work on this stuff and it's not easy, right? It's not easy and um, uh, you know, even th there are certain battles that um, uh, think even about what military history is. Wh what's the historian that really agrees w completely with someone else, right? Th there are certain. Um, there is always this sense that um, something better can be said or done. You know, th like those um, uh, booksellers that you know, those writers, uh, bankrupt writers that have to sell a new book on the Battle of Waterloo, you know, b because they have to tell you how it actually went, as if, you know, we hadn't been studying it, like, for, for 200 years continuously, and everybody was a moron that didn't understand how the Battle of Waterloo went. But it, it's, um, it, at, at the same time, that there is this possibility of, of framing, um, uh, of getting this, th it's more like a sensitivity, really. It, 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 it's really it's not even intellectual. This is important, right? Because for from Clausewitz, um, for from Clausewitz, really intelligence is everything, but there has to be something extra to that, right? So you have to be able to sort out the systems mathematically, scientifically. That is to say, you know, from Clausewitz, at one point says something like, um, you know, that e e that that a real military historian, as every historian basically. Uh, because these thoughts are applicable not just about in war but basically any human activity should speak just for saying you know uh, c connecting perf demonstrating perfectly uh, you know incontrovertibly that one um, you know one cause brings to a consequence right and in in within this uh, this is a, r a relatively you know optimistic statement that however von Clausewitz uses probably to to make you understand that it's often the, the simplest things that that are the most difficult to, to sort out, right? So um, it, it's uh, everything works in the between, right? In in the way you in the joints in which you, you want to, to to model the system, and this is very important, really, uh, uh, for anyone. But there is this extra uh, coup d'oeil, uh, this. Um, sensitivity that that objectively only experience can give you, right? Y it, it, it makes believe it makes a, a lot of difference if instead of stu having studied one battle once, you have studied 100 battles, right? Seriously, which means with from the sources, not from you know my YouTube videos, for example. Um, I try to to bring a bit more of that complexity on on the plate when when I speak, but. You know the, the big difference is made by the actual studies of sources, and 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 and, and you get to one point where you can start. Uh, you have enough, uh, com you know, um, experience, competence, um, and to to apply the so-called military logic, right? For which even if there is no factual evidence, um, historical evidence about a certain datum, you can mm, go far. Always meant maintaining that it's I, an hypothesis can be better or worse, but still an hypothesis um, that something happened in a certain way, and, and it's mostly an analogy thinking, right? That um, goes to it kind of declines why when you you start, for example, studying battles that are increasingly complex, right? You know, uh, studying, for example, ancient warfare. It's dramatically easier because it's kind of simpler than studying already medieval warfare. If we're not talking about mo modern or <laughs> contemporary warfare, it's, it's a mess um, because um, you have those two or three sources. I mean, that's literally it. Uh, but at the same time, you have a, a surrounding set of notions that you pro usually encounter when you study these battles that tell you that, look, you know, since in, in other occasions that there are, it's not that things really happen in the same way, but there are certain things you have to take into consideration. Here maybe you know nothing about, but that could have played a role in here. You s it starts becoming easier. Start, mm, uh, you know, following a thread that's 
that is a bit of a rationalizing direction, but it's, it still pays off, I, I would say. And and I get this often from 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 many videos when uh, you know when when um, when people ask things like you know did you like um, that that fixate on details right as if the the problem was the existence for example the existence of weaponry right it, it often happens like you know did these people use uh, this kind of weapon well sometimes you know the answer even without having an evidence right um, certain weapons like uh, spears or uh, or bows or sling I mean they're pretty universal um, and it's not that you know the fact that there is more or less evidence of this is uh, the proof that th that there was actually more or less use of that or since there is no evidence of one weapon in a, in a certain century and it wasn't used right you know that it was there you simply uh, however, acquired the experience for which you know that fr from that specific time and places, um, there is no source whatsoever, and you know why because sometimes it's normal. Sadly enough, um, but uh, you you have no problem in accepting that something was very likely to be there, even if you can't see it objectively, right? So, and and there are and the, there are stereotype stereotype uh, the theory. Uh, Okay, let's forget it. Stereotypizations. Here we go. Uh, that uh, that follow as a consequence. For example, um, uh, iconography. There is a lot of uh, interest. In fact, it's mostly a, a war gameistic interest to to picture. Oh, what did can, would, what would that warrior in that age look like? And and and, and there is a somewhat accurate reconstruction based on what you know. But that becomes the the icon of what like all. Uh, the, the prototype of what all warriors of that kind should look like. Uh, that also doesn't work, and that often stems from a you know a synthesis uh, of you know several you know look at iconographical material, look at archaeology because that reveals you uh, reveals to you a lot more than what you're um, used to think. And there is also dramatic homogeneity sometimes in, in many times and spaces in history. For example. This is something I often say that uh, th th there's a paradox that you know when you think about medieval warfare tendentially I'm not saying that you personally do it or that I personally do it but the tendency is that there's this great attention on uh, on combat styles and tactics right for which uh, the, the the main thing, I don't know, the English during the Middle Ages was longbow, right? So the, the English armies were kind of, at this point, radically different from, from a, I don't know, a French one. It was all about cavalry, right? Um, while, in fact, there were actually very similar armies in the first place, and uh, because there was a dramatic material homogeneity uh, and a, you know, rare condition of symmetries, of course, in a world where the, the technological uh, standards were pretty flatly uh, homogeneous, right? So, um, and and yet, and instead, when you talk about I don't know, twentieth century warfare, it seems as if you know everybody was alike, and you could even you know make it a sort of uh, uh, you know e e uh, you can't get to the point of who was better was was worse just because who was more courageous or who was not like those uh, jokes on uh, I don't know on the French surrendering and that uh, and, uh, similar amenities um, because people don't understand instead that. The I don't know, 20th century warfare is marked by dramatic structural differences between the various countries and armed, uh, relative armed forces have to do with industry uh, production, with uh, uh, raw materials, uh, uh, society, etc. So, uh, politics. So, mm, we sometimes we, we get, we, we interpret the world upside down. Um, and military history is dramatically healthy as an activity in order to dispel these perceptions. I mean, it's like a medicine, you know, if, if, you have, if you have never gotten through it, it sounds as if, you know, pretty something pretty, um, you know, complex and difficult to achieve, but actually it's, it's really a great fluidifier, it's a great medicine against dogmatism and irrationality. So do study military history because that teaches you an awful lot more than about war, uh, rather about politics and society, because this is, at the end of the day, what von Clausewitz also tells us. Clausewitz and Trinity. Um, Alright, so, mm, starting this uh, 
from Clausewitz writes, as contemplation on war continually increased, mm, and its history every day assumed more of a critical character, the urgent want appeared of the support of fixed maxims and rules. Right? So, um, I don't know whether we can stop here in order to opinions might be proved. Um, okay, yeah, so this is the point. War starts to be watched increasingly, right? Because it starts getting a bigger and bigger deal. This is modern warfare. So we're not in medieval Europe where more or less every, it was every knight had a castle and uh, fought in that combat style. Yeah, there were a bunch of infantrymen with crossbows and pole arms and that was pretty much it. Warfare was um, not necessarily at uh, low uh, intensity, but it was definitely uh, on a smaller scale um, than what would come later so even the strategical uh, consequences were uh, of the single combats that were naturally smaller were kind of in fact uh, lesser right um, in modern age you start having larger armies because th states uh, start to centralize and to dispose of more uh, resources to keep an army etc so the battle especially starts acquiring not just the battle in general but also the management of resources and where to, to where to strike so strategy where to use combat right and and and, uh, and all the um, uh, say logistical problems that answer uh, from that um, but also the big battle right so the big shot that uh, which uh, entire states start to concentrate their own resources and and that you know s uh, makes the, them grow uh, always more uh, cautious about the use of this instrument. So that's the real point, that war starts acquiring such a level of unprecedented pr destructivity that um, I it's increasingly contemplated. Here von Clausewitz does well in explaining it. It says war continually, uh, contemplation of war uh, continually increased. Um, and its history, also this is the interesting um, uh, reference to history, the, its history every day assumed more of a critical character, right? So remember that von Clausewitz is not, ju it's not just an extremely skilled and experienced military man, but he is actually a military historian as well. So it's very important, we will see it, the importance of the von Clausewitz tribe is to military history, even for the theory of the art of war itself. So for m actual military commanders, not just like a person like me who stays here sitting on a chair making YouTube videos, but actual uh, people who have to command armies, right? Uh, so here it says there, there is a history that starts getting developed and, and more refined, because it says a uh, history that every day assumed more of a critical character. This is important. Um, w war in, in the Middle Ages was was uh, was fundamentally all about God, right? Uh, you know, uh, battles. Th this is dramatic. For example, to take Carolingian warfare. I think you, we we know how Carolingian battles worked. We don't got them nothing about them. We 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 the only battle we know how it went tactically speaking is the Battle of Zuntal. Is a Carolingian defeat, by the way, at the hand of the Saxons. That's literally the only battle about which the sources allow uh, a reconstruction of some sort. And um, and, and w w how, how what about that military history? Well, of course, there is archaeology, etc. But, but what did historians write at the time? Because there were historians, even if it was all about God. You don't think battles are, wi are won by man. Battles are won by God. God decides who wins and who loses, right? It's all a moral problem. And the interesting fact about this is that um, some of the Carolingian historians were actually military men themselves and, and clergy, you know, because abbots went to war and Carolingian abbots weren't like timid uh, clerics or, uh, living secluded. They, they were actually military men that were simply like all the other warriors but just had received an ecclesiastical fief. Uh, say beneficent better by, by from from the king, and so uh, sometimes you you even get more details from cultured, real uh, clergy right, than than this abbot that literally went to war because that abbot would mm, 
tell history in a rather conventional way uh, that it, it even he participated to the battle, for example, the battle of of Fontenoy, this massive bloodbath that had happened. It was probably the bloodiest uh, Carolingian battle ever. It was a, a plain butchery. And he was there. The only thing, he, uh, you know, the, the, the he he wrote was literally like God made those wo winning, and, and that's it. So what's the take on this? The take on this is that, as we have explained also in the previous videos, nobody at the time cared to tell history in a different way, and not because they were religious people. This is the other myth that it was because religion made people ignorant. No, if anything, religion during you know, the Middle Ages made people more educated because that's uh, effectively all the educational structures were were um, promoted, uh, in fact, with from from the church, and including literacy, etc. So th the the point is here it, that uh, the point was not needed because who fought um, did it in, in a system that was simple enough, not for requiring a theory in order to be applied. The men of war already knew how, how what they had to do, just like the guy who built cathedrals knew what they had to do. And, and there were sketches and things and definitely a know-how. The Especially the military class in the Middle Ages was largely illiterate, but uh, at least up, you know, up to the, the, the late Middle Ages, but um, so that had an influence as well. But the concept is that even if they had wanted to write about it, they, they would have not developed the theory as we uh, of war at that point. Because they would have written in a milieu where everybody knew how, how that worked. And it was sufficiently simple to not to make it interesting to, to speculate on something that was under everybody's eyes. right? Um, in the modern age, s things start to change. And it start to change exactly because of these structural reasons. The Renaissance wasn't sparked because someone found, you know, a new Greek bo manuscript from the ancient world that arrived to the West and everybody started, you know, building a civilization. It absolutely didn't happen like that. Civilization had already risen by itself and now was enough educated to, to know that there were books there and to read them for their own consumption about things that they already knew how to do but that they wanted to systematize theoretically now. Um, that's the real point. So that's how it slowly ha happens, and it's very slow. It's very slow because if you read a Renaissance treatise, uh, uh, at least it's not about I don't know the geometry of fortifications. So th there is a very few um, objectivity in there. I mean, most of modern age was still dominated by superstition, like you know that there were spirits and uh, and weird things happening in nature and materials, alchemy, astrology, and all that stuff. You know. Um, and it was actually a great intelligence. I mean, you think that astrology is stupid. Well, you know, try to study um, astrological treatises from, from the modern age. Those are freaking complex things. And, and it, it takes an imp a great intelligence to, to be able to develop that in the first place. So it definitely stops to a certain level. But it also um, is the reflection of a society that is starting to elaborate more and more and trying especially something we don't do any, uh, anymore now because we got to hyper-specialized and we, we close our eyes in front of so many things, to, to have an omnicomprehensive understanding of, of, of reality. Um, and obviously, you know, uh, there was much less to know at the time, uh, but um, there was this idea that you could fundamentally understand the broader sense, not just th the detail, but I mean, the, the detail was framed into a world that that had, you know, where the detail had to have a, a meaning, a sense, a significance, right? Naturally, what this was this is also a, a a religious thinking that doesn't make things simpler. Actually, it makes them, uh, you know, it, it sparks um, the, the need of of critical thinking. You know, how do I approach, especially during the Middle Ages, where you know. The unity of, of, of the church was broken by the Reformation. New worlds were discovered. Uh, you know, people were f literally freaking out. We, we think the Renaissance was an age of happiness. And uh, it, 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 like the 16th century was, w was a tragedy for the people who lived into it. And it was something, uh, you know. It, in, and so, but that's the crisis that sparks this new thinking. That's the crisis that 
pushes this man to, to, to create new patterns of interpretations, new criteria, new m methods, and uh, new approaches to, to science, to, to the world, right? And this include war, right? But it took centuries, in fact, up to von Clausewitz, to arrive to this objective view of th the thing, right? Um, the, this is important. It, it didn't magically, the modern age, in many ways, are much sim more similar to the Middle Ages that we're, we're traditionally thought to to to, build, to picture them like, and uh, they do contain sometimes this em em empirism or um, effective symbolism, right? M much of the military theory that is developed during the Renaissance is sometimes just um, just a sort of decoration, right? You know, the idea even the the the, the theory of the perfect formation. But you know, formations do not have to be perfect geometrically. They have to work on the field. But yet, there were plenty of people who drew and thought of what the, the perfect formation could be about, and thinking that it could apply, you know, just uh, Roman tactics uh, or, or Greek tactics in, in a world that was radically more advanced uh, at that point and that presented much more complexity. So they didn't know that, but they were already doing way better and were expanding this w that way of thinking that had remained from the ancient world pretty stationary, uh, after all, um, throughout all the Middle Ages. Um, but the, the Middle Ages that had managed to produce now the conditions in which um, this stuff was, was, was in, in ferment, right? So it's, it's very important. And uh, what von Clausewitz also stresses in this phrase is the urgency to uh, uh, support, th um, th um, you know, the history of war. So this is a history, first of all. Um, um, this is a tale, right? Remember what we said in the previous video that um, the this mm, reflections mm, uh, originated chiefly from and incidentally, from in, in memoir and narratives, they didn't start from scientific treatises. They started from sometimes diaries and and and, uh, and letters and chronicles and uh, stories, basically, right? And and here, so it's a story. It's a way of telling the story. Uh, there is this a brutal prejudice towards, for for example, narrative sources that is out there that I'm, I always fight against, especially in certain countries where objectively narrative sources were why less um, developed than in others, so that this part of this pre prejudice, but, you know, s s you know, it, it's unknown to every medieval military historian that um, uh, medieval chronicles are of brutally violent importance for understanding everything about medieval warfare, right? And and you can't take them just, oh no, that's narrative, so it's not real, right? Because when you start reading 100 of them, and you start realizing that they're telling basically all the same thing, and that thing corresponds to all what we know about military history of the time and also other times, you start realizing that the narrative sources are actually telling the truth, and part of the reason <laughs> why is that if you listen to von Clausewitz, it's exactly that. At, at the time, it was relatively easy, in fact, to understand what warfare was about. Not only it was easy in the sense that everybody knew what what warfare was like and how how it how to frame it. In fact, theoretically, because there is a, a dramatic lack of theory in that and scientificity and categorization, but they got what was you know. The, the the important dimension like like the compactness of the formation, moral leadership, um, the, the that are expressed even by people who were were even actually not military men for example, but maybe were laymen, not just clergymen because towards this this time this last centuries of the Middle Ages laymen start to write, and it's a completely different way from what the clergy did, um, so. Uh, there are new interests, right? I started. I made a video recently that is. Um, I don't remember. It was humanism. Subtitle was a new way of telling history. That that explains this in part. Um, but it's a history.
right? So this is not, and let, let's think of what this implies. You know, a history is first of all something that has to be read by someone in some way. If it's a diary, it can even be a you know, personal diary. Well, usually not because they were mostly family diaries. At least they were very socially oriented sources. So these were this was stuff that was read by someone else and that therefore owns a certain degree of reliability because other people had to, you know, accept that it was at least plausible, right? Even plausibility aside from realism or accuracy here it, it's important because it's not it doesn't even matter what what actually happened rather how this was framed and how it was accepted at to be plausible right R realistic um but secondly uh, history requires um kind of a temporal frame right the renaissance is the moment in which you start having a broader kind of a pretty standardized at that point um, perception of history uh, like a uh, from the origins of the world it is actually starts since the from the middle ages regularly but you you, you this takes a, a, a deep diachronic um, interpretation of the past and a diachronic approach is um, immensely functional to explain military affairs Right, you know, every you, you if you're a military historian, words of this name, um, you have to to be you have to look at history diachronically because war forces you to um, to to interpret history diachronically. Um, the the person who believes that in order to study a war you just start the, the the day in which you know the first shot was fired is 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 not a military story it's not a historian in the first place right um, the, 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 there are it's very important to understand the causes of a war the the, the inner the inner conflict that brings to that and how you got to that point so when you're explaining uh, in the renaissance uh, real war in hell, you know, they they fought like, like hell at, this, at that time, um, and you have to to start understanding why you know a battle was won or lost because you were part of of that world, you know, and and that made a great difference in everyday life. Um, so that's where, as von Clausewitz says here. There is an urgent um, need, want here. It says um, for of the support of fixed maxims and rules. That's how it began. You have to explain how how it works. Take Machiavelli for example. Machiavelli um, uh, before uh, von Clausewitz and and Montecuccoli was the most important um, military theorist in Western history. And uh, what does he do? You know, he he didn't actually understand much about war, but he had a pretty clear idea of what uh, how certain things worked in the first place. And he starts making generalizations. He starts saying, you know, the Swiss, for example, flagged in this way. He starts actually, uh, uh, you know, picturing what what tactics were worked like, really. You know, in fact, the Swiss were pikemen. The, the, they were the French. They were mostly about cavalry and artillery. Then. The Spanish were, I don't remember what he says, because he actually, you know, the Spanish were objectively at the time the most balanced armies. Then, but he says basically the Italians are the ones that have all kind of theoretically all three um, tactical, you know, uh, cavalry, infantry, and uh, artillery. I mean, they already know how that is necessary for. Um, so that if they had united, they could have won it's, uh, the, the, the wars, etc. Of Italy, etc. But uh, it starts giving a frame how how to reason in this. It's not a story. It's not it says Charles the Eight invaded, you know, conquered Naples and then uh, came back. You know, it it's it's way more than that. It's it's making a theory, a theoretical distinction of certain types of military of militaries and of of of, uh, of tactics in obviously scoping deeply also politics um, that's where it all starts really from and that's what 
actually Machiavelli is most famously for, yeah, more as a political theorist than a military one, but as a consequence, and if you if you know von Clausewitz, you perfectly know that it, it means basically the same, also about war. Um, the uh, Montecuccoli is the one that starts telling really how war should be fought on the field, like, you know, what you should be done, what would starting to find this generalization. So it's still the 17th century, so there's already a kind of a uh, putting an order into chaos, uh, into Western uh, way of uh, looking at this. And that's where modernity is, 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 is coming from, is, is starting, right, you know. And, and it, it starts from the theory. It starts from this idea that there had to be certain maxims and rules, so not really axioms, but really stating sometimes what appears to be the obvious, but at that, that time had never been put down for, uh, you know, on paper, for the need of of making it of practical use, right? So maxims and rules, that is to say, you know, usually in battles this thing happens, or at least this is, this is what may happen, this is what regularly happens when you have a type of unit that, that that clashes against another type of unit um, and similar things. And, and von Clausewitz here specifies that all of this happens in order, quote, in order that in the controversies naturally arising about military events, the war of opinions m might be brought to some one point. This is also an extremely important phrase because um, he, he states the, the problems were definitely harassing the same uh, military thinkers in von Clausewitz's time, is still do today, <laughs> by the way, um, about the controversies naturally arising about the military events. What von Clausewitz here calls the war of opinions. So there's not just a war on the battlefield, but also a war of opinions to, to figure out what happened on the battlefield. And as you know, von Clausewitz answers to this by saying, you know, even if when a battle is won, we, we don't necessarily know what happened. I mean, for real, right? You know, you, you can't often say, you know, what, what was it? Was it, you know, the, the messenger that arrived late uh, for the order? Uh, or was it the terrain? Or was it, you know, how can you do it? It is rarely a decisive event. It's a sum of factors that you, you can't quantify in the moment in which they happen and that therefore you know the military historian at one point has to to be aware of so that uh, uh, that's why simplistic s mm, explanations are stupid right you, you can't say oh well it was simply like this because that guy made the choice and uh, you know that's how it happened mostly it's, yeah it's, I give you it's mostly a matter of choices like uh, intelligence as we've seen has that role but um, Battles are complex stuff, um, and um, even certain choices can take d can have different consequences given that particular environment. Always remember, the military commander at best knows three fourths of what has to be known. Uh, excuse me, one fourth of what has to be known. It means that what he does doesn't matter how intelligent or, or stupid. Um, it's it's only makes only one fourth of what could be done on purpose, uh, 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 in, in an aware way, uh, in front of three-fourths of unknown. So that tells you how even decisions are you know, not necessarily what will make the difference at the end of the day, but the difference can be made by the sum of factors that of which you can't really identify a decisive one, because objectively there is not a decisive one, it might not be. There is not, most of the times, a decisive one. They're just determinate ones that altogether make things take in a direction rather than another, right? And, and it's interesting that uh, the theory of the art of war emerges from a, a polemical problem at the end of the day. That it's all more polemical because this is all one with politics. It's mostly military men here, people who understand war who have prestigious offices in the state, in the army, that start writing about this stuff. And naturally, think about all the pamphlets and the uh, ferocious competition, like, you know, explaining a battle, saying, you know, the general screwed up because he was bad, you know, or, you know, maybe he was defeated just because he wasn't like, you know, made a difference, made a, had a political impact, just like it, it does today. 
Th that's why history, and especially military history, is so easy to weaponize against opponents because um, it, it, it becomes really um, you know, a matter of um, most of intellectual competition to prove something uh, and to prove the other person wrong. You know, Andreas <laughs> in, in, in you know, military history can, uh, you know, when when we we talk about military history, we we, we like to have tendentially this um, aggressive, um, uh, competitive a attitude, like saying, "Yeah, you know, you're you're an idiot. Here, I'm more intelligent. You, you know," I, and it's mostly of the times really a matter of intelligence, right? Uh, it's thinking things through. Uh, at different levels and different directions and and being reasonable and logical and, and not dogmatic or irrational right so uh, that's something that automatically speaking triggers this kind of interest right um, into in, into the theory into this and that's where abstractions sometimes take the place because um, those are positivistic thoughts that our mind is what instinctively relies on to solve situations that are apparently simple, but that in this case are literally the most complicated, uh, uh, complex and complicated to to understand um, in in the whole realm of human activities. Right. So um, this is important. Right. Uh, it has to do with, um, and there could be here important comparisons between also how this clash occurred during previous times where the, 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 the military theory was not yet to be it uh, was not yet developed um, but let's skip it for now um, yeah this here what might be brought to some one to some one point right so the the aim of all of this from Clausewitz is saying of all of this debate is getting to in fact one point right is probably saying something that concludes or exhausts um, the the matter right the debate at a point where there is a hopefully a shared consensus where one person you're right and one other is wrong and this is cool because even in terms of intellectual competition when you have something that can't be fully like everything but especially war in this case can't be fully comprehended. There is always a margin for further speculation. So I don't remember whether von Clausewitz even claims something like that. But uh, a war, uh, among all the other, it's a booster for civilization progress, and it is probably also um, one of the greatest uh, developers of such critical think. But this is something that, in the, the perspective of history of philosophy, I never quite heard. And it would be interesting to investigate maybe in some some thesis or other research because it it, it really had an impact. Like war, the the, the, main, the the general stereotype is that in fact, yeah, military men are kind of anti-intellectuals, right? And they're often criticized in them. But telling the truth, um, this is not really like that, right? And war necessarily requires kind of on average more intelligent people to be carried out that's why there is a hierarchy that it, it becomes towards the top increasingly an intellectual one because it's a, about a uh, it's really about making a decision at that point not about being courageous or strong on, on the battlefield right it's quite of a different thing and it's not easier it's not easier I mean it may be you know less traumatic of course and less risky but it's increasingly more difficult in terms of the positive attainment of an achievement, right? So here from Clausewitz goes on and says, This whirl of opinions, which neither revolved on any central pivot, nor according to any appreciable laws, could not but be very distasteful to people's minds. So um, this is also important. Um, because here from Clausewitz reinforces the, the the problem that the interpretation of war posed, right? And the first one is that there's no fixed standing point. 
that was the main problem at the time is that objectively you know mm, you know theory is dramatically useful it's like a bit when you make uh you know it's a bit like the comparison you can make between sources and historiography right you know sources are like still the most important thing but historiography is like already the interpretation of the sources from a critical point of view so historiography is built right just like a theory let's say and it, it it requires this conflictuality but it has to start from somewhere it has to expand it somewhere and 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 in this sense it's very fascinating to think of how easy the incomprehension and the misunderstanding o of certain objects can be right it's really uh, easy to make uh, uh, a mistake of uh, of judgment uh, you know uh, uh, of assessment uh, in military history it happens all the time it evolves all the time this also can be experienced by by yourself you know think about uh, some military uh, topic of yours that, that you, you find your favorite one you know and, and thinking how it, it how much it took in, in order to develop and to refine, right? Um, such ideas can change very easily. And actually, the more you put in, the more this thing complicates, especially. So it was not an easy task because it, it was not a clarifying. I mean, th there was a, an absolute improvement, of course, in this um, understanding of war, but still, such improvement arrives to the natural conclusion that von Clausewitz uh, represents in his work that there is no conclusion that most of the times what the point is not proving some you know that in order to understand what r actually happened because nobody will ever know that the problem is how you can translate at that point your knowledge about war into something you can use to win a war because uh, let's be honest about this von Clausewitz writes the von Krieg in order not just you know to to tell a story but hoping that this will serve for someone that will have to fight for his own country uh, if, uh, for his country not to be defeated because he had been through a massive defeat of his own country during Napoleonic Wars when Prussia was annihilated at Jena at Auerstedt and, and yeah th that was something that von Clausewitz paid with you know, on his own skin you know he even fled to Russia he had to fight all back you know he was condemned um, to death um, the French were ruling their home so you know pretty messed up things that obviously today we can often only hear of in spite of the fact that of course there is always some conflict uh, here and there but I think most of my viewers uh, have not been in there um, and um, the concept is that this is extremely relevant to us today in the first place in any case right and I it's not just about um and and that's where it gets done when when you want to find those uh, kind of macho acting guys who say yeah you know war is so simple i understand it everything you can reduce it to maxims and rules what our civilization has brought it to is to the von krieg that is enormously and robustly and and and, and, and strongly structured and and, and loaded of of, of understanding and of, of 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 intellectual effort. That's what you need in order to win a war. Regularly, it's the more intelligent that wins, not the stronger one. And it couldn't be different. You know, strength is for kind of most primitive. Uh, intelligence is for the most advanced, right? Uh, we uh, we are not more intelligent. Uh, let's say more capable with uh, of, of of a warrior. But we can uh, we can easily pick up a gun, shoot him dead <laughs> without any particular accomplishment because our civilization has inherently brought this kind of development that is a, uh, simply a different view of the world, a different approach to reality, a different uh, system of values as a consequence. But let's um, get him to the point. Is is it what von Clausewitz stresses here is the the effort, you know, in order to find some appreciable laws, right, uh, 
that could satisfy people's minds because you know it's pretty discour uh, you know um, discouraging to um, to presume that there is no positive take on reality that basically things happen and you can't control them like we know that because we all know that we we can stop our aging and dying and suffering but we say who cares in in this sense we're applying a system that is extremely pragmatic but it's also a, a rationalized uh, approach to to reality like you know yeah life is short and fragile but what do you have to do about that you know do something about it, the time you have uh, and uh, so th there was the sometimes even the arrogance and the to to pr the presumption of actually finding a law right so something that gave this mm, security this this emotional security about the the attitude you could have towards war something brutal because these people made war uh, so they they knew what the cost was so I it's a desperate call for this thing it, it, it was not something that concerned mostly civilians but people who had to confront with war kind of every day either in politics or in, in, in on the battlefield um, so we need a narrative this is also very important like and how how do we reconcile the problem of um, of this impossibility of solving the problem and the fact that we have to deal with the problem well the answer is the von Krieg of course and, and this answer uh, is fundamentally that the awareness about this is already a, st a, a very important step ahead and, and this is not just about war. This is about life in in any aspect of it. I, it's knowing that things fail, that they do not go as planned, that we have to think through more and better. That can make an actual difference because it's the awareness of of a failure. Right? It's paradoxically the failure that produces results. This is also something that has been stated by I don't know, think about Popper or you know um the the um, you know the the idea that the major accomplishments of science and civilization are not actually based on positive steps but on failures right a as long as you succeed you have it easier and you lower the guard that's instinctive it happens all the time literally with everything every every year in your everyday life but when you you fail and and you assess the costs of that failure well you're not going to forget what you've learned and that lesson learned will make you progress so that's also how it happens in science that's how it happens in evolution was not positive evolution of ours we are we are here and in the way we 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 are genetically because other people died while our ancestors lived on and they could have easily died as well so it, it's a miracle in the first place that we are here you know if you ever wish to win the lottery just think that you exist that's the biggest win ever uh, so yeah th this opens naturally as you understand to, to many uh, philosophical uh, digressions but we're not going to take this path um, as we talk about von Clausewitz, but von Clausewitz is also this. Von Clausewitz is also this um, intelligence, this intelligent awareness that is not a surprise. Not not surprisingly, comes from war, right? Because that's um, the, the the greatest challenge that exists. 
It's the most concentrated, it's the most brutal, it's the, the less predictable, the, the less controllable, the least controllable. So, yeah. Uh, okay, so for now, I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it, otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming contents. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.